The land lies wrapped in a dream, still and silent and waiting. Then with a surge of youth, a college is born. In 1965, the University of California founded a unique campus at Santa Cruz on what had been the Henry Cowell Ranch. The plan of UC President Clark Kerr and founding Chancellor Dean McHenry was to focus on undergraduate education within the context of a University of California general campus. In 1990, over 200 alumni from the first year returned for their 20th reunion. In the next hour, you will hear 17 of them tell what it was like being a pioneer on the new campus, how the campus has changed, and what advice they might have for today's students. We few, I think a phrase from Shakespeare, we happy few. We're together then, in our own little moment of special importance, which lives on today in all of us, with the remembrances which we bring back. I came in 1965, um, when the trailers were here. There's only 650 students, and I feel like when I meet somebody who was here at the same time that nobody else understands what we went through because we lived in a utopian community. It was the only time in my life I lived in a utopian community. Um, I felt like we practically didn't need food. We lived and breathed ideals and very high values and that guided everything we did and we were living in a spirit of intellectual vigorous inquiry. We were living in a community of connectedness and love and Paige Smith was the guardian of us all and created an atmosphere in which we all felt safe and intellectual inquiry was valued, encouraged. When my parents brought me up here, I got out of the car and I looked around and there was this blonde, tall girl unloading bags, and I thought, oh no, everybody here is gonna be a socialite and, and it'll never work, I'll never, I'll never cut it. Two years later, I discovered that she had looked at me and thought, oh no, everybody's gonna be an intellectual and I'll never make it. But it turned out there was room for all of us. Uh, I was first in my family to graduate from a four-year college, and I think I was really lucky just out of circumstances to be here. I'm an army brat and I went to 12 schools before college and when they dumped me in the middle of world civilization I had no idea what a Greek was, what a Roman was, I didn't even know where Europe was even though we had lived there. So this basic education here turned out to be the best thing that could have happened for me personally. I didn't think about it too much until about five years ago. Um, it seems to me that Santa Cruz as it was resulted from the collision of two really quite divergent forces. Uh, Clark Kerr and Dean McHenry were planning for a Santa Cruz that was sort of an embodiment of a classical gentleman's education and Oxford English college system as an alternative to the alienation of the multiversity. Um, and they gathered us all up here on the hill, 500 of us sort of chosen by hand from somewhat over 12,000 high school graduates who applied put us all together, and the last thing they expected was the great merge of the 60s, which broke down all barriers and took the experiment off in a somewhat different and rather entertaining direction. There was a definite sense that, that uh, we were creating something out of whole cloth. Uh, it, was, it was clear that uh, in, in many cases, there was a, a vacuum as far as what to expect in terms of uh, traditions or, or customs or customary ways of, of doing things. And, and we were inventing the entire campus, the entire culture as we went. We made it up as we went. We weren't just creating a college from scratch. We thought this was 
a base on another planet at which, on which the 500 of us students and the few faculties and perhaps a few friends from town could start life over anew as if we were the only people on the planet and all the rules were up for grabs and we could just decide how things were going to be. So that we would debate rules of who did the dishes in much the same spirit that we would debate the meaning of Plato or how to best stop the Vietnam War. It's, it's interesting looking at the campus now and looking back. I mean, the great things about the first year, the thing that sticks out most in my mind is the sense of camaraderie and the sense of purpose that we were pioneers, but it wasn't just fun that we were pioneers. We, we, were, um, we were imbued with a sense that we were setting a pattern. We were helping to create a new university in a, a new or newly recreated pattern, and that we, we really felt we could have an effect on what this university would be like in 25 years, like today, or in another 25 years, on into the next century. And I think that that sense of purpose led us, or gave us sort of a sense of, of freedom as well, that we felt that we not only wanted to have fun and learn something, but we were being responsible for our grandchildren's education. I feel that having been here created certain types of human beings, people who valued certain human values, like compassion, like caring, like inquiry, like curiosity was valued, um, thinking carefully, thinking independently, listening to other people, seeing ourselves not just in a segmented period of time, but seeing that there were other possibilities in life, and that a search for truth, and a feeling that there are high values that you strive for that guide your life. When I come back now and look at the place, I think how unaware we were at our young ages of 18 of what, what a treasure we had been given and what an experience that we had been allowed to participate in. Um, and we were kind of naively going through it, realizing something big was happening but I, I think that we were somewhat young to really truly appreciate what was happening here. We lived in trailers. There were eight of us to a trailer on the, on the field where the field, the field house was like our main classroom. There were about 500 of us, 16, 17, and 18 year olds, pretty unsupervised. It was a lot of fun, but it was also pretty scary, pretty unsettling. I've been at five different universities since I left Santa Cruz, and in none of them do you have the opportunities to uh, interact with, with people in a, a social and uh, intellectual atmosphere uh, that's quite as intimate uh, as we had here in Santa Cruz. And of course, particularly uh, starting out in the trailers and the field house, uh, things were particularly intimate, but even as we moved on, past that to where the buildings were more strewn about the campus and uh, we were spread around different colleges. Uh, the same sort of experience was still available. Trailer life was uh, very close because we had eight people uh, living in one single wide uh, trailer. We didn't have to cook there, but we had to sleep, study, and uh, clean up there. And it didn't leave uh, much room for privacy. Uh, it certainly, I don't believe it would have been uh, anybody's first choice, but uh, we made the best uh, of it that we could. And in fact, uh, what it forced you to do was to find other places outside of your home uh, to uh, study and to uh, find some sort of peace. The friends that I've made here are truly my lifelong friends, my closest friends, and even though I have many other friends and have made many friends through my life, um, the degree of intimacy and understanding and sharing of basic values that I feel I have with my friends from Santa Cruz, um, it, th this is a unique experience in friendship. 
uh, lifelong friendships. I, I have no doubts that the friends that I have, the good friends that I have from Santa Cruz, I will, they will be my closest friends throughout my life. Although I wasn't necessarily close to a lot of people here, I did have several friends that I became very close with, and I think it's fairly miraculous that over, over 20 years, we have maintained our relationships, not just by letter, but by seeing one another, that we have had our own reunions several times over the years and that those relationships sustain me in my life and are very, very important to me. And although we all live in different places, that we still find much commonality in our life. Another element of what made Santa Cruz very special, specifically Cowell, was the attentiveness on a human level that was given to us by the early faculty. I'm sure you will have heard from other people about the quality of the teaching that was extraordinary. But what I mean is things like Paige Smith sitting down with a Facebook at the beginning of every year and memorizing everybody so that he would know every student by name. Uh, fall of my sophomore year, I was deep in the pits of depression. Um, there, I didn't have a boyfriend. Nothing was, nothing was the same. Nothing was right. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be an English major, but what was I going to be? What was I going to do? I didn't know. Time to drop out of school. And I asked Kim Butel, uh, what were the procedures for taking a leave of absence? I then found that same day when I went to check my mailbox after lunch, a beautifully calligraphed handwritten note from Jasper Rose, which I still have somewhere because I was so moved by it, that essentially said, I hear you're thinking of leaving the college for a while, please come, come and talk to me about that. I'm, I'm worried about you. I was amazed. I didn't know he knew who I was. And I went to see him. And he tried to get to the bottom of, of the problem. You know, is it a course that you're having problems with your classwork? No, no, it's not that. You know, what is it that we can give, give you to help you? And I spent the interview on the verge of tears because I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what the problem was, but how amazing that somebody cared enough to try to find out. And about two days after that, Paige Smith stopped me on one of the paths around Cowell and said, Betsy, you don't look as perky as you did last year. What's, what, is there something wrong? And I burst into tears. And uh, I knew that I wasn't going to go anywhere. This was not replaceable. Whatever I was struggling with was going to be a heck of a lot easier to work it out right where I was than anywhere else in the world. And of course I did. I was not a superstar. I was not somebody that anybody noticed particularly. I was just one of a lot of reasonably interesting 18 and 19 year olds who were going to college. But I was not, I think, distinctive. And I got loved. And that amazed me then and it amazes me now. I, you know, I want that for my kids. Wherever they end up going to school, that's what I want them to get. I guess like all of us didn't understand what I was supposed to do in college. Everyone said I should go, and of course I was going to go, but I didn't know exactly what college was supposed to be. So I talked to a very nice man at Santa Clara at Stanford. I visited an English class and fell asleep um, in a class for the first time in my life and was interviewed by a sub-dean in some sub-office of the admissions office. And then we called up Santa Cruz, and Paige Smith answered the phone and said, well, do go see the campus, but um, then come by my house for tea. And you turn right at the Brussels sprouts fields, and then he went on. I thought, hmm, this <laughs> seemed to sound very interesting. I just feel like one of the luckiest people to have had the education that I had. And uh, I still keep up with certain friends from, from Cowell College days. Um, living here in Santa Cruz, I have the chance to bump into Paige Smith or to attend his Penny Lectures, Penny University Lectures. Um, I see people socially who are connected with the university. It's a constant reminder to me that who I am today is to a large measure, um, you know, the credit it belongs to Cal College and, and UCSC. Or Paige Smith, founding provost of Cal College. By exhortation, you have taught us history and manners. <laughs> By example, you have taught us creativity, 
breadth of perspective, the joy and seriousness of learning, the value of common enterprise, social conscience, personal integrity, and adherence to principle. Through Eloise, your wife and partner, art, style, and good sense have been introduced into our worldview as well as into yours. <laughs> I knew I couldn't get through. <laughs> um, we remember your lessons with gratitude and with affection. Trying to think about the components that made it that wonderful. One was uh, absolutely the natural beauty of the place. Grew up in the LA suburbs where the blue started that what far up the sky. From here there down it was beige or brown. And to be up here where there were real seasons, there was a fall. And since it rained for 40 days and 40 nights in the winter of my freshman year when spring came, it was this absolute astonishing event. One morning there were poppies and lupins all over the fields, and oh my god, what are those? I'd never seen poppies or lupins. These flowers come from, did somebody plant them? No, they just grew there. Um, so there was the beauty of it, but also the, the human qualities of it. The beauty of the surroundings. Well, just driving over the hill from San Jose for orientation week, all this greenery, all these, what I would call energy from the trees, all the wildlife, you could feel it. And you could feel it physically affecting your body if you have any sensitivity toward nature. I felt refreshed and cleansed. And going to school here, it was living in these primitive conditions, living in nature and trying to lead an intellectual life. It was very magic. We all had cosmic connections with each other, but again, it was the 60s. One other thing that I think was important about our particular experience here is that when we came, we came to a campus with three buildings and 2,000 acres of wilderness overlooking the Pacific Ocean, incredibly beautiful. And I feel that living in a small community and living in nature also affected us. By the time we left, there were roads, there were road signs, there were uh, prohibitions on going places um, that we didn't have. And I feel that living in nature affects people in a wonderful way. And I remember for about six months after I left Santa Cruz, I would walk in cities and I would feel emanations from trees and bushes. I lost it after about six months after leaving here, but I had it for a long time. And it's a serene sort of feeling. Being in nature connects you to a part of yourself that I think a lot of people um, search for in meditation or stress reduction that we had here naturally because we lived in nature. And that was very valuable. That I don't know how they could have at this point with so many students, I think if they plan the campus well enough, they might be able to have it somewhat. Certain values were built in. When we came here, we were told that when they built, they weren't going to destroy any large trees. Now that's an important value. It's an ecological value that was ahead of its time. Right now, the current plan calls for just about doubling parking on campus and building a new access road from the east and building a new sort of beltway road right across the middle of the meadows, across the middle of campus. And this is presented along with the same plans that say, well, we're in favor of transit and we're in favor of the environment. And that's, that's nonsense. I mean, if you're going to double parking on campus, you're going to double the number of cars coming up to campus. And if there was really a, a concern to make this 
a university for the 21st century, a university that would be sensitive to the environment and that would not be a carbon copy of Berkeley, UCLA, other major universities, then there's really no reason to have all those cars running up and down the hill all day. I mean, there are such things as buses, aren't there? I've had a pretty interesting career path. I've been in advertising and marketing, and I've been involved, in, I've been involved with uh, the youth culture. So what I saw here in Santa Cruz as being part of this wave of bright, aggressive youth, I continued on with my, my professional involvements until about uh, five years ago. And then I came down here um, when the keys got changed to the provost's house at Cal College, I guess that was last spring, and I was having a discussion with George Amos. He was, um, he was a professor that uh, was important to me. I remember that the first poetry I had ever read was in, uh, there were Dunn's love, Dunn's love Poetry in his class, and, and uh, we talked a little bit about that. And he told me that I was one of his more perplexing students because he couldn't, figure out why my papers were so absolutely awful and why he wanted and why he would have failed me if uh, we weren't on a pass-fail system when I seemed to be a, a bright, eager student. And I don't have any re recollection of this, but he said he had a clear recollection that he took me after class one day and showed me this paper and said, this is horrible. This is terrible. Think. And I said, think? Is that what I'm supposed to do? And no one had ever told me to think before. And it must have started something. And I'm still thinking. Education at an undergraduate level is not it intended, in my mind, is not intended to result in a career. But it's to result in being a thoughtful, reflective person who has a, a, an overview of civilization that allows you to be uh, have perspective as you make decisions and participate um, in community life and um, that that broad vision is is really what education is all about and um, and I realize that may be a luxury that we were allowed because we came through at a time when there was an ever expanding career career opportunities and the economy was always uh, broadening and becoming richer and richer. I uh, got what in the United States is probably as close to the classical liberal education as, it's, uh, as it was possible to come at that time and, and probably at this time as well. And that meant uh, a familiarity with, uh, with the arts, the sciences, literature, history, um, Essentially, all of the uh, all of the cultural elements that that really determine where we are as, as a people and as individuals. There's been some talk this weekend about uh, generalist education declining and specialist education in the ascendance and the problem of that. One thing that I think distinguishes all of us who came here in the early years is we're a bunch of career switchers. So many of us have done so many different things. Um, right now I'm a lawyer and I'm going to do it until I decide to go live in the country somewhere, um, which will probably be when I'm 65 because I'm having too much fun doing what I do now. But before that I was a number of other things. And I think the generalist education that we got here, the learning to think and learning to write and the fostering of curiosity that we got here, is what's given all of us the ability to make those changes, to decide, well, OK, I don't have to do this if I don't like it. I can always make a living. There's always a way to pay the rent and put the food on the table. I don't have to do something I hate just for that. We had, I think, as a group, the confidence that we could make those choices. 
And I think a lot of it came from the, the curiosity building, open-ended kind of education we got here. One of the um, primary interests that I had while I was a student, which later became a career for me, was work in the theater. And there was no theater department. There we didn't even, I, it seems to me I got credit for, for maybe two classes in during four years of working with theater extracurricularly. I just did it because I loved it, and that's what everybody else did too. And I think that much of, of um, a lot of Santa Cruz students, graduates now, I think, are doing work that is just important to them, and it's not so much for the remuneration. And um, that comes back to haunt us a lot, I think. But I think there was also something about the value of doing something because it was worth doing in and of itself it was something we got very early on that I guess is lacking a little bit for kids now. Um, one early theater experience I can think of was I, I went through the barn theater with Bob Mooney when it was a barn and there was absolutely nothing else in there and we thought about where we would put the support facilities and how the stage would go and how it could be lit. And it was very exciting to see that then within a year become a performing space which seems to be still in use even though now there's a beautiful real theater here and that's very exciting. But we started out performing in the courtyard or the dining hall or wherever there was space, which is what theater's like. It's but remarkable how things that you think you're never going to use, uh, little bits and pieces uh, turn up years later in something that's totally unrelated to uh, what you initially learned it for in the first place. And um, probably the thing that's, that's most important is a way of thinking and a way of uh, approaching subjects uh, that is nonlinear that allows you to cast about and uh, approach, approach things in a, from different uh, angles and different viewpoints. And I think that's the most important thing that you learn in college. I'm a physician. I remember in medical school, in fact, I'm a surgeon, and in medical school, uh, I never paid too much attention uh, when I started out. Uh, as we were studying anatomy because it wasn't something that I was interested in. And later, of course, it became very important. So I think you, you can't tell ahead of time what's going to, going to be important to you, and that's why it's very important for you to have a fair amount of breadth in what you're exposed to. I'm a bilingual teacher nearby here in Watsonville, California. Um, a mentor teacher, I'm proud to say, which gives me a position of leadership to my other fellow teachers and educational leadership for them. Um, I'm able to go into their classrooms and help them, uh, consult with them, take extra training and seminars, and bring more um, knowledge to bear to the field of bilingual education, which is also a new field. So I think that um, attending UCSC, which was an experimental campus, gave me the courage to try more experimental things in my life. I, um, my husband and I also had an experimental school in Mexico that we tried for about four years for people to go down there and learn Spanish. And it was, we had people from this area, it was connected a little bit with the UC um, Merrill College Field Study Program, Nick Royal, and, and he sent several students down, many students down to our school. There's a very interesting study by American Telephone and Telegraph Company of their executives. When they hire people out of college, the most people that are hired uh, several years ago were hired with a background in economics or business administration. They hired a few people from liberal arts. And they found that after five years, the liberal arts majors had risen farther and faster in the company than the econ majors and the business administration majors. And the reason for this was they determined that people with a liberal arts background had the ability to relate to people and get new ideas and incorporate new ideas in business far better than did the people with a business or economics background. For the last year, I have in fact been uh, working uh, in Washington, D.C. At, at NASA headquarters on the, uh, on the new program that appears to be on the horizon now, which is the, uh, the human exploration of 
uh, the planet Mars and, and the nearby solar system. And uh, that is a, a topic which, while it certainly has a technical content, and, and it certainly will employ a lot of scientists and engineers in, in defining exactly what the content of that program is, nevertheless, it's something that's done on a scale that requires the active uh, participation and active uh, validation by, by all of society. The, the, any, any large undertaking um, that is going to command collective resources uh, has to have the approval, if, if not the, the active endorsement, of, of a wide range of society. That's just the nature of, of doing things like this in a democracy. And that, by its very nature, uh, requires being able to uh, examine a proposed program and and uh, understand what is in it for 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 people other than those who are the most immediately employed, and being able to define a program such that it does have a content and a and a, and a worthwhile payoff for society. I think about the fact that if, if I had it to do over again, would I have been something more specific coming out of Santa Cruz? Certainly, if I had the opportunity, there are other courses that I would take now that I didn't even think about taking. There are courses now that didn't exist when I was here that I would love to take advantage of. But the, the notion that it was all open to us, that there really was anything we could do, I think is, is critical. Um, there was a sense of optimism that was there for us because we were making something new then we could continue to reinvent uh, throughout our lives. And what discourages me now is to come up against people who say, but you haven't been doing this for the last 20 years. Why do you think you can do it now? Well, why can't I do it now? It's, of course I can. Just uh, you know, give me a little head start or tell me what to read, and I can do it. And that's, um, that was a gift uh, that came of, of uh, good teaching and good exposure to ideas and to possibilities that happened here that I guess, I guess not everyone is as lucky as we were to have that. I wish they were. I primarily work in, uh, in policy matters in Alaska and uh, uh, there's a number of Santa Cruz students actually up there, a number of them who've really uh, made a very big difference in the future of that state over the, over the last years. And what they brought um, Alaska is a very kind of dynamic and changing place right now. And what they brought, and the reason those folks stood out so much, is the kind of breadth of experience and understanding, and and the uh, sort of range of, of uh, kind of people tools, just sort of an understanding of people and what they needed, and the kind of breadth of uh, of uh, things that had to play in issues. Not only that, there were a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of personal skills that you know, enabled them to, uh, to exceed. And one, one of them, uh, more than any else, anything else, was a kind of a lack of specialized training. They weren't taught and they and, uh, didn't really pick up a habit of focusing in first. They focused out first and tried to, uh, to put, put things in some wider context, kind of a wide angle view of the world, certainly of their world and the issues there. And it's made really a tremendous uh, difference. In particular, I think, the uh, environmental studies program has sent, oh, I think we probably have 50 or 60 residents of the state now who've come up, and there's been a good 20 of them who've made some real substantial contribution to the state in a public way that, uh, that would be well known and recognized. So one of the real interesting uh, discussions that's occurred continuously this last weekend is this whole question of the extent to which uh, students now are Picking majors early are, as the last speaker uh, talked about, worried about um, their financial future at an age that strikes me as being decades too early, really. I think tactically in some ways it makes sense to specialize earlier. I remember uh, some of our biology professors talked about the importance of having credentials to sort of get a break at a little kind of wider range of things. And that's really true. Starting at you know, starting at the wide end is, uh, can be very frustrating, and there's not well-defined paths. Um, uh, people whose jobs, you know, depend, as many of them do, depend on, you know, uh, and their own sense of security as well, depends on kind of a predictable order of things, are really not um, 
comfortable with giving folks a break who, who come in uh, perhaps with a wider uh, focus. But I think in the long run, um, it's served both those students and certainly the society and the, and the causes they've espoused uh, very well. Don't worry too much about careerism. I was pretty much a high-profile radical when I was here and, and certainly wasn't a careerist at all. And my career has worked out just fine. I'm you know, quite gainfully employed in the computer industry and, and do good work and make a decent living. And it's certainly possible to do that without trapping yourself into the rat race early. So you know, have some fun, play around, think about how you're playing and play about how you're thinking. And don't worry, things will work out OK for you. There are many debates um, these days about reinstituting core courses at many universities across the United States, and the debate always has been um, whether Western civilization courses are too ethnocentric, um, if that limits people's views. And I came to feel from my year of Western civilization is that if, it's, if a course like that is taught right, ultimately one has to make choices about what's included in those courses. Um, but if they're taught right, it, it almost wouldn't say it doesn't matter what you're teaching, but if it's taught in the right spirit, students will broaden their own view themselves. My education has meant a lot to me because it opened up my mind. I came in as a very Goldwater Republican and went out of here uh, on the uh, you know freedom marches. So it really definitely uh, turned me around and uh, politically and educationally opened my eyes to what the whole Western world was about. Um, that Western Civ class just showed me so much. We had to take it all year, freshman year. First of all, it, it taught me history. Um, it taught me how to write. And it taught me the joy of, of having a common intellectual endeavor with other students. So I think that one thing that sets our class apart from many other alumni classes is that we had something in common intellectually to share that I think still in many ways informs our conversations. And certainly in, has informed my approach to my own profession, which is that of a biologist, which seems sort of far-fetched. But there was something about that course um, that made you see the sense, in addition to giving a historical perspective to everything you did, taught the value of connectedness between things. It, it got you in the habit of synthesizing information, of relating uh, information, uh, not only between cultures, but between disciplines. And I found that very valuable to my own work. Um, it, in many ways, was a lesson in creativity, as well as in the value of breadth of perspective. Um, I remember the first, at the, at the um, after the first year, we all had to take a six-hour comprehensive exam um, in all of Western civilization. Um, and we had not had any, any exams earlier in the year. And I remember that the power went out in the trailers the night before the exam. And it, um, it seemed to me that I heard at that point a chorus of, oh, no, um, at about 10 o'clock that night when that happened. Um, anyway, it was the only exam in my whole life that I ever enjoyed taking um, because it somehow tied together everything I was learning in a way that I just found terribly exciting. Because it was such a big deal, that year, and because there were no tests for the whole year, classes were canceled for two weeks so everybody could study for the Western Civ final. Um, it was rather important you didn't get to come back the second year unless you passed it. It was 100% of the grade, and it was pass-fail. So everyone went off and tried to study their notes from a, from a year of this class. And after two weeks of study, we all marched up the hill to the Natural Sciences One building. That was the only building at Santa, only classroom building, to sit and take a written essay test for six hours. And we all marched down the hill to think about whether we were coming back to Santa Cruz that night. 
This was at the, in the spring of 66, at the end of the first school year. Now, with cunning planning, someone, and I'm not sure who, had planned a party for that night in the Cal Dining Hall, and there was a large banner over the entranceway back to the resi residential compound where we all lived, and the banner said, Western civilization is over. <laughs> now, I seem to remember, although I'm not sure, that this may have been the first public social event at Santa Cruz at which psychedelics were consumed. I may have it mixed up with, a, with one of the culture nights, but I think it was that night. And certainly, if you think about the changes between uh, the 1965-66 school year in which many of us were quite intellectual and a little bit off by American standards, but still basically straight. And the following year, as the counterculture really began to merge with the educational experiment, it really did seem to those of us who were tied up in it for five years that Western civilization was in fact over. And it wasn't until some years later that we began to see that it was still a force in the world, although perhaps a force whose influence had begun to wane. When I was in high school, I was your typical aggressive idiot. Very intellectual and very ununderstanding of other ways of looking at the world. And when I took LSD, it turned my mind and my life inside out. and enabled me to understand that every person, every discipline, every culture, uh, every belief system has a very strong basis in reality and a way of seeing reality that other cultures and disciplines and academic uh, outlooks do not have. And that the experience of taking psychedelic drugs is what changed our generation so drastically, which allowed other historical forces and combined with our generation, those who were in college in the 60s, to change America. I don't know what I would tell a fresh person today. Um, I felt somewhat saddened by uh, Clark Kerr's talk because I don't know if a person today would have the same opportunities that we had. Um, but I suppose they could search for the same things and, and try to find um, a place and a community that would let them do that. That's something I think the current students should be reminded of, that the opportunity is still there. I know a lot, of, a lot of them still have that feeling that they can still help mold the university, help try to keep some of the ideals of the early days alive, the college system and the emphasis on undergraduate education. And you know, if I had, if I had an audience here of, of undergraduates, I would tell them really to, to keep doing what I see them doing, and that is, not be too quick to compromise on their education and their children's education and their grandchildren's education. My graduate studies were at Berkeley where we had, uh, I believe it was 1,500 students in the Chem 1A class and students had to watch on television in remote rooms and they were like cattle being uh, herded through and they had very, the only uh, individual interaction they got was uh, from their teaching assistants. And that sort of uh, education was what Santa Cruz was set up to avoid. And I see it slipping back uh, toward uh, that model. When I went to Berkeley, uh, all people could talk, talk about was their grade point, grade point average and taking tests and memorizing things. And they took experimental psychology, which had to do with rats, which didn't seem to have any relevance to, to life to me. And I didn't think people were into learning. They were into getting a grade, whereas here we were just immersed in learning. I do think that we were a select group of students who had come from, who had very high uh, grade point averages which I think what it meant was that by the time we arrived at college, we had very internalized ability to structure ourselves and to organize ourselves and to think carefully. And we didn't need an external motivation to get us to study. We wanted to learn. And we were, I was felt so freed up by not having to worry about exact 
memorize things. It was just freed up to learn what I wanted. It was just the most freeing sort of feeling. I ended up getting a teaching credential, and I taught for a while, and I found kids getting so worried over, you know, little kids getting all worried over their grades that I switched to a pass-fail system and just counted up the passes in their homework. I said, you're learning it now, and if you get two-thirds of it right, you pass. And if you don't, you just got to keep trying it until you learn it and can come up with a passing paper. And uh, some kids were still kind of worried about that, but you know, in the end, I think they liked it a lot better. Collegiate atmosphere with common experiences and uh, common things that are studied um, and uh, a focus away from disciplines was the reason that we all came here, one of the main ones, and it's one that's been lost uh, at Santa Cruz as much as I can tell. Uh, it sounds like about 10 years ago uh, somebody elected to move the money away from the colleges and the power followed the money as it frequently does. And uh, the other thing that I'm uh, hearing as I learn more about the current campus is that uh, the population has been increased without uh, actually uh, increasing the, the uh, substructure uh, that needs to be there to support it. And so what I see has happened at Santa Cruz is that it's become less personal and it's become less oriented towards the colleges and more uh, oriented, uh, say, the way that Berkeley would be in terms of having a, a board of studies or departments uh, running um, their faculty members and that the students are beholden to the departments rather than to the colleges and that the colleges have just become a place to eat. I give the money back to the colleges. I think that's that the power follows the money, and uh, if the money was ex uh, originally the money uh, went to the provosts and they had a say in um, how the money was spent, and so that even though it was illusory, the the faculty members had some feeling that they owed some allegiance to the college and that they needed to, to participate at some level and that they belonged there. And uh, when uh, they had no other reason than, than just on paper to have an affiliation with the college, uh, they're busy people. They have other things to do. Uh, I could see why they would want to spend their time uh, at department meetings or doing research uh, or developing their upper division courses or working with their graduate students uh, rather than to spend time helping out with general education of undergraduate students. UCSC doesn't have to be like every other university in America. There are a few other collegiate universities and there are a few other universities that really care about undergraduate education but there's nothing in a major university system that's like what Santa Cruz was trying to become and still could become if people push hard enough, if the students push hard enough, if the faculty who care about the college system push hard enough and just tell the administration both here and the, the, um, the regents that no, we're not going to have a small Berkeley here on the ocean. It's not necessary. There's a big Berkeley over the hill. People can go there if that's what they want. I just think it's really important and it's, it's a way for Santa Cruz to keep itself unique is to keep focused on breaking down the border between the academic and the non-academic. I mean, all colleges have parties in which people are social and they all have classes, but it seems to me there's a chance at Santa Cruz for those, those two worlds to be less disjoint. 
so that the human experience can be seen as sort of more integrated and more tied together. Um, if Santa Cruz has a chance for anything, I think it has a chance to do that. And I would just encourage people to, to, look, to look for ways to do that. Like Clark Kerr and Dean McHenry, I was a graduate student at Stanford University. <clears throat> there was a postdoctoral fellow at Berkeley and then taught at Swarthmore College before, oddly, returning here as an ersatz grown up um, as a research biologist and lecturer. And um, since Clark Kerr ostensibly thought of Santa Cruz, he used as his explicit models a blend of both Swarthmore College and Berkeley. I found it amusing to think about from my own experience, what that means. And um, um, what that means to me um, is that I think that Santa Cruz indeed, to use the words of the early cal um, catalogs, has the potential to be, to blend the best of small liberal arts colleges with big universities. Um, and in, um, I found that Berkeley and Swarthmore were in, in many ways similar to each other in, a, in an odd sort of obverse kind of way, that they both shared the perspective that teaching and research were antagonistic activities. In, at Berkeley, um, it's, this is more obvious probably to more people, um, research was valued and people were under somewhat a bit of suspicion if they were dedicated teachers. At Swarthmore, it was oddly the reverse, that research was held under suspicion and if you were too excited about your research, people held you in they figured that you couldn't be a good teacher if you were interested in research. If Santa Cruz can be the place that can show that teaching and research indeed can work synergistically in ways beyond the, the rhetoric that uh, American academia is so fond of um, using, but to really make that work, this could be a terribly exciting place. Um, Santa Cruz has gone through many changes since I've been a student here. Some of them are good and some of them are, are perhaps regrettable. Um, I think it's good that the, that the university is a more diverse place than when I was a student here. I think it's good that it's grown in that sense. If it had stayed the size of, say, Swarthmore College, which it was when I was here, um, it would be a more limited place. On the other hand, of course, I think much, some things have been lost here. And it's not only lost here, but at other universities and colleges. I think Santa Cruz, among other universities, has lost some sense of what it's doing and why. In this, it's absolutely not unique. Um, but if it can regain that sense, um, this could be a terribly exciting place. I think the potential of UC Santa Cruz is staggering. When I came here as a freshman, I was kind of from a small town. I'd never met that wide a variety of people as I did when I came here. And it was just amazing to me that people would fly in for the weekend and uh, visit their sons or daughters. And this was just a, a whole realm that I didn't even know existed. And um, I hope that this university won't be only for the privileged and, and only for the wealthy, the way it certainly started out seeming to be uh, really you know, like the upper crust. Since I work with disadvantaged children, I, I would like to think that they have just as great an opportunity for an education as I did, or as that Beverly Hills high grad does, or, you know what I mean? So, um, I wouldn't know. If I were going to talk to someone who is in high school now, and, and like I talk to my own children, I, I'm married, I have a son and daughter who are both in high school now, and even though they live here in town and have come up here for summer camps and things like that, they've been on campus, I don't think they're going to go to college here, and that, that kind of makes me sad. But what they're looking for um, isn't this kind of an education. I think they're looking for different fields. Uh, maybe, like Clark Kerr was saying this morning, education has become more specialized. Uh, I'm not sure they're interested in an intensive humanities education. And, um, and they're like so many of the other young people their age today. They're worried about where will they live? Where can you live when a, a house costs $350,000 just for a, a little family home? Um, 
I think young people today are tremendously concerned about how they're going to survive economically. So can a young person today spend four years reading Plato and the um, great writers of American literature? Um, I don't know if, if that's too great a luxury today. And yet, as Clark Kerr said at, at the luncheon, or right following the luncheon, at a time when everything is becoming more specialized, it's the very time that we need to have a more general view of things and a, and a broader understanding of the world. at least I rather glory in the idea that among the moments that people have had on earth that uh, we can say that we're among a few people, a happy few, who participated in one of the great moments and that was the creation of this campus uh, with its great spirit, its new approach to higher education, or attempted approach to higher education, and that we share this memory, and I will cherish it all my life, and I'm sure all of you will too. Thank you.